Okay, hello. So, uh, I, I am a little bit nervous because uh, I actually expected a room like 10 times smaller and much less people apparently, but that happened. Good. So, hi, my name is Bo, that's here, and that's Michael here. I am, uh, okay, so who we are apparently. Um, I am uh, ex Suze in uh, on a paper, but not exactly in the heart. And uh, I am uh, ex developer, so to say, of Saltstack. I was developing it a lot as a contributor from the Suze side. So, and I was also presenting it uh, in form of Suze manager. I am author of uh, Bridge between Ansible and, 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 and Salt and many other things in the Salt stack until it uh, fade away somehow, unfortunately. And so who we are apparently. Uh, right now I am working for automotive that you supposed to see the car here but uh, not sure if you see it so we are working for automotive and we have some little experience with cars like 35 years most mostly your car is actually using our uh, software if you press the brakes for example that us so uh, we are active open source contributor. For about a decade we work with uh, Google, we, we contribute to Android, we contribute to Yocto especially, and lately we built our own uh, distribution based on Ubuntu, which is basically a remix, but we adjust it a little bit for the automotive part. And we do the cybersecurity management that kind of sounds important. It is important, but probably not important for you, but very much important for the automotive, avionics, and this kind of stuff. So, what we're talking about today. Um, one um, also funny part happened that I, I, I thought uh, half a year when I was thinking about this talk, I thought, uh, it would be nice if I would not be together with the Nix OS guys because they will be because there are some overlaps you will see in the future, and uh, and this happens that Brian just talked about that uh, Nix OS and that's kind of funny apparently. So um, we are also talking about the Im image provisioning, right? And. Uh, that's a little bit different from our side because we have to take care of all the embedded parts. We have to take care about all the uh, specifics that we are in our industry, and um, um, we are looking for the uh, for, for for different solutions. And what we are going to present today is something like we are in alpha developing, and would be nice to know your feedback, what you think about that, and uh, maybe you give better ideas. Maybe we're doing something very stupid. So I don't know. Let's see. So imagine you have some repository packages. This is an example, right? This is just um, um, Ubuntu typical repositories. Can be whatever. Can be RPMs. Can be uh, we we don't care, right? Then you have kind of like list of packages. Uh, in this case, we're using Kiwi appliance, uh, something that SUSE generates a lot of images with, and uh, Kiwi appliance. Um, by the way, be ready your phone scanners. I will be showing a lot of QR codes, so you can just blink it and then go to more information about that. So here is a little snippet. How do you provision uh, whatever image? Uh, whatever means container, means uh, ISO, means raw image, means QCOW image, whatever you want. And uh, you just basically say the packages you want to, to have there, right? And then basically you're provisioning it. Uh, I'll tell you also in a minute why I want to have it in provision. And then you using some engine that does it. So um, builder, Kiwi, Docker, Beremil, whatever. Uh, I'm talking about the Beremil this time. That's our uh, extension to the Kiwi. So we're using Kiwi as a library. But we want to use it a little bit more than that. So what does Beremil, apparently? It's our sub-project here. And so it just wraps around the Kiwi appliance. If you don't know, look about it. Uh, if you do know, then you don't know. You, you know. But it adds like Yocto-like workflow. 
So if you're familiar with Yocto, now you can also use the package-based system with like Yocto approach. It also gives you multiple variation of the same image. So in Kiwi, you always have image description in XML inside. And then if you want to change something, you have to change the image. And then you have to want to have a couple of images. You have to do the carbon copy again and again and again. So there's something we don't like, and we uh, made some um, extensions to that, so basically you can like subclass that. Like in Python, you can subclass the class and change whatever you want there. And uh, yeah, so we have this description inheritance derivatives. We can make also containers with it, and we can do whatever other stuff with it. And so, say you create this image, right? You build the image, you have it, the image is fantastic, all, everything okay. Now the funny part comes with NixOS because I'm sorry for the, for, for the naming. I, imagine you went through all that and you have your image, what you can do. Who knows about uh, Ubuntu snaps? Who doesn't like Ubuntu snaps? Same, yeah, I know. <laughs> so what we did, we also not that like them, to be honest. But you know, what we did, you can put that image back to, to the repository as a package. Uh, the project uh, called Flake Pilot. So, but it's not Nix Flakes. It's different Flakes, but still Flakes. So, I'm sorry for the naming, but yeah, well, that happens. So, we will demonstrate you how you do that. But imagine you create your workflow completely with OCI container, and then you just like push it to there, and then you automatically create the package and add back to your repository so you can do apt-get install or dnf install or zipper install or whatever your package manager of the day install. And then you can basically have this, um, the whole thing as a snap way. But uh, the difference is the we have a different run times there, and I will, Explain you shortly about Flake uh, pilot project, which came up to me um, just basically automatically, and I invented it. And Micha, uh, who is our Rust guru, uh, did a lot of uh, contribution there, uh, and I caused him a lot of headache of my bad Rust code. So <laughs> uh, con we do this with this pilot, pilot containers as images and. Uh, Basically, VM images as packages. Uh, virtual machine is Firecracker in this case, so you can create virtual machine, and you do apt-get install your package, and it's actually an image, and actually the software in the image, and actually runs as VM. You don't even see that. It's like completely transparent way. Um, uh, why we do this, right? Um, you would say, well, there is Alpine Linux for that, right? So you can generate something like that. The thing is, we have to be responsible for every bloody bit we put on the image. Because if you die, your relatives will come to us and say, you create something in your car that your car automatically turn on the autobahn to the left, you know, and say, I, I have to prove it, it's not true. And that's why everything that we put on the image has to be really, really be sure and genuine. And so it has to be built from packages and it has to be, be on the process, right? So we cannot do like make, make, install, hack something around and then you have the, 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 the container. That's not possible. Um, yeah, it, it supports OCI containers, images for Cracker, and it has different runtimes. So, for example, you can use Podmon, you can use RunC, CRun, Northstar, whatever other um, container runtimes you like and format you like, so you can always do that. Um, and it has package gen generator, so you just like press a pedal and, and you get your package without all this nightmare writing spec files or DC files or something else. Or those control and rules and everything is all automatically for you. Uh, and use case might be, be for you as well good. We use it for AB update. So we, uh, be, back in times uh, in, in, in SUSE, I remember I had a lot of headache uh, updating software. We uh, were doing uh, some projects at SUSE, and it contains a lot of packages. And it's all fanta fantastic works when you provision the first time. The second time when you update, 
we had a lot of bugs exactly only on only on updates. And if you look at our uh, L3 line, uh, bugs that actually destroys people's life, you know, so to say, they are, were all mostly about updates. So if you update the system, somewhere something went wrong, this package something went wrong, and so on and so on and so forth. And I was saying, guys, how about you just kill it? I mean, you, you provision only because you have the application, it works, right? So you can basically take the whole thing and just like throw away and put the new one instead, right? And you can just update the schema on the database if that's your database is somewhere else. This is it, right? And you kill all the class of the problems by that. And so one of the use case here we have that our operating system usually comes completely read only on SquashFS. So when everything goes wrong in car, in your entertainment system or something else, you just do factory reset, you know, and then you just flash to the beginning where it was. And so on top of that, we can use these actually uh, flakes which are residing on different partition and you can even install packages and uh, software on the read-only machine, basically, in different partitions and without rewriting all the packages, right? And so that's the problem now. What kind of problem? That's the problem. I guess you already understand it, right? So when you're provisioning the image, right? Say you use the bootstrap or you using zipper root or you using DNF or whatever, you get a lot of stuff. The SUSE has an uh, operating system called Juice, just enough elephant, I call it, because if you install it, it's bigger than your kitchen, and then you have absolutely no space anywhere else, and it's like a really huge one. But I want just my application there. Everything else, why it is, what it is doing there. And, as, and you would say, well, there is Nix OS, right? Just like Brian was explaining how, how nice it is and everything. Yeah, it is nice, it's just not applicable to us. Uh, at least two things. It's a LGPL 2.1, which I will never put in the car. Same as GPL v3, because it requires to open the hardware. That will never happen because of the re re regulations and all the possible restrictions we have. And a second, <coughs> And unfortunately, Nix kind of takes still a lot of RAM and uh, CPU in compare to very small stuff. Um, we're not that much uh, thinking that uh, it's a good way to have the same packages copied many times, you know, and of course you can swipe it, yeah, but, but you know, this is how it is. But I mean, if you uh, have more tools for different um, solutions, that's kind of like good, right? So you can use different uh, variations. Another problem, uh, I mean, not a problem, an, an, another target, what I'm thinking, uh, what about NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, because it potentially can work there as well. And so maybe you want to have entirely different operating system. I am uh, personally coming from Solaris. I love that a lot. So p pick your poison, basically, right? And so you see provisioned container is much bigger than that. And there is a lot of stuff that does need to be there, apparently. Uh, then uh, there is also auxiliary data. All the stuff like, um, I don't know, license text, man pages, um, the localization thing, maybe you don't need that on a disk in the first place, right? And so on and so forth. So what, what kind of attempts? Well, we are here because, yeah, because packages has dependencies, right? So it's a, it's a D graph, basically. And dependencies are often uh, unoptimized because how we build packages. Hey, Hans, it doesn't work. And he says, just include that package. I include that package. Now it works. Well, it, it increases my software by twice. Okay. Okay, it works. Uh, this is how it, how it does, right? <laughs> and so graph can add, but cannot remove properly. How many times you're adding, installing software, you get like 300 dependencies, but when you're removing it, it tries to auto-remove on Debian something, but sometimes only one package. Because those dependencies are basically shared, right? And then it knows what to add, but it does not know if I remove it, it will it break something or not? And that's the problem. And 
we get with software blocked by unused libraries and other data. And we have this fantastic configuration drift. That's why we don't want uh, to update our, say, routers or critical machines with packages because they're causing that, right? And so what are attempts uh, to fix that? I, I, I could talk about many of those, but I will just take one from our partners, which is Canonical. So that's Canonical Chisel. Who heard about that? Nobody. Wonderful. So <laughs> Canonical Chisel, what they do basically, right? So that's the code. It installs all, only essential Ubuntu package parts. So imagine you have a package. Inside, there is a lot of fa files and a couple of .so libraries, right? And so what they say, they keep the database outside for that release, for that package, for that version, and they say, these files are essential, everything else is not. So when you are installing that package, the chisel knows what to simply delete from the disk or keep only those files that are there, right? So that's basically the idea. Uh, it's based on the idea on slicing, so basically loosely coupled data, and they, and they get pretty much into nice uh, results. Apparently, they could deliver .NET uh, and other uh, big chunks with a relatively small amount of di disk space, and they were kind of successful with that. And then provisioning is like using building blocks, right? So. They, they they have a description in the database, and then when you say, I want this, 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 this package, so the chisel looks only what parts of those packages need to be installed, and then it constructs you the, 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 the size of it. And then they took the motto for that. The, the sculpture is already complete within the marble blo block because before I start my work. It is already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. So Michelangelo thought he takes a brick, takes a chisel, takes out junk, and now you get a f head of a David. That's how it looks like. Uh, look at those shadows and all this marble. Fantastic. Except the result, a little bit different. That's expectations. That's how it looks like, actually. So it is, it's okay. I mean, it's also a way of doing sculptures. Why not? I mean, but it's a little bit different, right? That's we want there. And so we came up with something else. It's called Mezzotint. So what it does? It does automatic art artifacts analysis. So basically, it's automatically scanning your software and sees what is actually needed there. The problem is I am using there both uh, ways. Um, the uh, package manager, which gives me some junk information, and also scanning actual ELFs and to understand and binaries what actually is loading. That's also tri tricky, but it works so far. It's a di completely distribution agnostic and uh, actually has no specific database or distro re release. It's not bound to anything. Um, it works with package manager of the day. Um, I am thinking still porting that to BSD as well. And so let's look at the differences. So basically, Chisel requires a per release database. Mezzotin doesn't, so we don't really maintain that stuff. Um, different package managers. Chisel, of course, works only for Ubuntu on AppGet, right? So Mezzotin doesn't care again. Will uh, I, uh, right now, in this point, it's only up supported and a little bit of RPM, but uh, we will add that. Don't worry. Uh, so it requires package manager. Ch Chisel requires the package manager, so it needs to map the package to the database it has externally. Mezzotin, yes and no. So um, it uses uh, package manager to scan the graph of the dependencies, but you can turn it off or you can use only that. Right, so or you can both, so you can combine that. Uh, oops, wrong dire direction. Uh, and it's Ubuntu only, Chisel is Ubuntu only, Mezzotint is not. And so we managed to get up to 70% of junk out from the images. And the images are much smaller than actual 
um, after provision. And so uh, Micha will now demonstrate you how that works. Uh, please support him because I am uh, like longer in this configuration management account. He is like first time here, so he is very nervous right now. So please, pl please welcome him. Can you hear me? No. No. Test test. Ah. Ah. Hi. Okay, so yeah, I'll give you a quick rundown from the very top as soon as I find my cursor. Okay, I guess you can't read that. Can you read that? All the way in the back? Okay. Great. Okay, so of course we first have to start off. We can provision uh, cursor. Yes. We provision our uh, system from scratch. We're using Builder here. I don't know if you know Builder. It's like Docker uh, build, but different software. Um, now we would have to provision the whole image. I don't know. Uh, hands up if you want to watch we provision a whole image. Yeah. OK, I guess. I, I had something prepared, but um, I guess we can already take some questions while this will be going. So, uh, while this is running, any questions already? <laughs> so, right now you're watching uh, uh, Blink and Light. And, you yeah. Know. It's so like, the bootstrap uh, just initializing the <laughs> minimum Ubuntu installation. It just installs the base system, and 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 again, uh, <clears throat> you would say we have uh, this uh, Alpine Linux thing, right? So you can use it, of course. The point is, I don't trust it. I need to build it myself, and I build everything from the packages. We build everything on build service from SUSE. We have our own uh, internal. Um, uh, setup of that. Why we do this? Because uh, it uh, ensures that the whole environment of each package is really uh, made from genuine sources and in, you cannot inject any, anything in between. It's secure, it's uh, signed with the only correct uh, key and, and all the packages are really belongs to us as a vendor. And so that's why we do that. Okay. Um. So now uh, what we actually want to uh, package in this example is Emacs because we thought we hate ourselves so we tried something complicated. So let me really quick install Emacs here. But we also will uh, add Simlink as a VI so don't worry. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we'll really quick store that so we can uh, so we can uh, compare it later. So that's our big emix. And now maybe we can show how big Emacs is right now. Mm, yes. Uh, so if we uh, put in images. Yeah, so we have like 400 and, and half megabytes. <coughs> yes. Almost half a gig of the just uh, editor, which is turns to be a good operating system, but not that good edit, edit, editor, apparently. So, and what we <coughs> have in here is our uh, config file for our method. In, so, we want to keep this package basically, and we know that we also need these for functionality and filters all, so we want to remove everything we can find that we don't like basically. And we have a hook at the end. As you can see, we yes. will create you life better if you start Vim and you get Emacs in your face, then you will Google how to get out from from it. Good. <laughs> okay. So if we try this out now, I hope it will work. Okay. So maybe I zoom out a bit again because we can see there is a right, so that's, huge list. That's a method in showing you <laughs> what it found and what is will be removed. And yes. You can see that potentially still 22 junk files uh, still can free something. So if we now remove 
the, the dry run. Hopefully it works. <laughs> and it at the end tells you, hopefully it even works. <laughs> so, so, just so names are correct. Paste it real quick. So now we're going to commit the new one so we can compare. And then where was our grab? Just the max, yeah. Let's just compare these two. Okay, I had some other ones, but we have our small Emacs here. And you can see now it's only 135. Oh, but uh, but take to the consideration, there is the entire system yes. there, right? So you also have glibc and all that other stuff that requires there also, the, and curses and everything. So, yes. yeah, it's basically you can make your entire workflow. So not just Emacs, right? It's just for demo, but you can create your entire workflow as one package, so to say, say an entire Python stack or an entire Java stack or application that runs on top of that, right? So it's not just for one Emacs. So now if we want to package that, we're going to use uh, our Flake tool. Um, no. So what we do here is just a simple setting. Um, we're going to build it, well, from this OCI we just created. That can be any OCI, obviously. And this is the app that's going to run if you just execute it without anything. So basically the uh, Docker target. So what is happening here uh, from OCI, it means it will look at your registry, actually, and will grab that. Um, so if you build from OCI, you build like a Docker image or whatever, you can build from a, a zipped OCI, or you could build from your uh, VM image that you have for Firecracker, for example. And uh, this will, by default, just build on the native package manager, so this should just build a Debian for me. Oh. So you can see that's all the Debian build output, blah, blah. I hope it works. I also hope it works. Um, OK, so but now if we look in our out directory, we have all the Build artifacts there. It also uh, respects all the uh, build requires because to in order to run Flake uh, like that, it's basically a launcher. So if you say uh, user bin Emacs, it's actually sim link to Flake launcher, which is reading somewhere a configuration, uh, picks a proper runtime, in this case Podman, with proper all the um, parameters and everything, and launches that to, for yeah. you, so you. So that's yeah. what we have here. That's this path, right? And now, if we oop, move that to the VM we have prepared, whose IP ho hopefully did not change. You have to show them there is no Emacs there. I only copied the the, the Debian so far. Okay. And then we get out our beautiful pristine, well not that pristine. Uh, VMs, I already installed uh, Podman here and the. Uh, because we were still paranoid that the yeah, network the, will not work, yeah, so it was sorry for a little also. bit yeah, slight so cheating, but it's not that cheating. You know, so. <laughs> Usually the dependency would pull in our pilot and the pilot would uh, pull can in Can you make Podman. it bigger, yes. like uh, oh, yeah. virtual machine view yeah, full? Yeah. Because the people will really yeah, su yeah. suffer with, with that. Yeah, I'm sorry. The yeah. S okay. Scale display always. Okay. Yeah, and then make it full screen, yeah, okay. and, and increase it. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, now call uh, okay. call Emacs or Vim. Yeah, so uh, Emacs is not here. Or Vim. Uh, I have no idea if Vim is here. No, Vim is not here. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I will have to disappoint you soon, Bo. I'm sorry. Uh, and so now if we just dpackage minus i. Oh, That's password, oops, not dpackage. That is indeed the password, sorry. dpackage minus i. Uh, small small Emacs, Emacs, yeah. It. So as you can see there, it uh, basically unzipped the uh, OCI image. And now if we Emacs, hopefully. It works. Hey, we're in. So. <laughs> so now does anybody know how to quit Emacs? 
<laughs> Just kidding. And type Vim. Uh, no, I have to, I have to uh, apologize to you for the demo. I only prepared the small version of the flag that does not include the sim link. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so the container contains the sim link, but there's no external. We will have to talk about that. I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, yeah, and the whole point is now. In theory, your user would not even notice, or your script would not even notice that you're not running vanilla Emacs, but it's uh, containerized. So when you call Emacs, apparently you're in the container. So we will be continue working that it's completely transparent, or you have Python, you write, run Python 3, and it's just like normal Python, but it's like from within container. And you even don't know it is one, right? And so uh, basically we solve the problem with, um, um, with with snaps uh, that you don't have snapcraft proprietary one so you just have your normal typical package manager whatever you want and you can use entirely containerized workloads you can completely not just one application put you can put the, the whole thing your your the whole workload whatever it is right and you can just install it with one go so basically this is can you switch back like like Yeah. Yeah, so basically this is it and uh Q and A. Yeah, you can ask questions. Go ahead. That is the question. Uh just out of curiosity, could you show what the uh, Emacs wrapper script looks like? The script, okay, so the, you mean the thing that launches into Emacs. Uh, so this, that's actually a Python, uh, not Python, sorry, a Rust application. So obviously for Podman that's quite simple, it just launches into the container of the right uh, arguments. But for stuff like micro VMs, it's a, a lot more involved because you have to do a lot more setup for the uh, environment to make that seamless because the whole point is that we try to make it as impossible to notice that you're launching into the container as possible. And so we have to do a lot of like firewall setup and stuff, especially for the VM version. But uh, I mean, I, I could show you the code, but it's too, yeah. You can have a look yourself <laughs> at the thing because it's, it's too much to um, Basically, the idea is uh, bluntly stolen from uh, Snaps. So how it works, a Snap has a launcher, small little launcher. And then when whatever your application is, USR bin foobar. And that foobar actually a sim link to the launcher. But when you run that sim link, the launcher looks at his name at like arc zero. And I am, oh, I am a foobar. Which means uh, configuration is actually laying USR, share, lib, uh, flakes, foobar and the configuration and then it reads all the configuration and says okay runtime is podman uh, these kind of uh, um, ar arguments and so on and so forth and just launches for you the, the, the podman this is it just, that's how it works any other questions any other questions yes yeah no it doesn't depend on Podma. It depends on whatever you want. It can launch anything. We also have Firecracker. We can add uh, North Star. You can say uh, this is Run C or C Run or whatever you want. Yeah. So we just showed the Podman one because that's the most advanced version. It's a con container launcher. Whatever you put in the configuration, it's up to you. You can run with anything. It's like, think about it as uh, like APK for Android, except it can be anything more than just APK. Right? That's it. Yeah, go ahead. Don't, don't, don't ask me that hard qu qu questions. I know you. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, don't, don't worry. Uh, just one question. You said you're running an uh, internal build system uh, or a uh, build service instance. Uh, so, you could have had the idea of building spec files and putting out an image that way so because you would get the reproducible builds and everything for free uh, now you need to care about it yourself if i got it right so you need to care about the reproducible builds on your own now somehow so why did you not yeah go into like optimizing your own spec files or something like this for building something like that 
uh, we, we actually do, but uh, customers have different ideas. Okay. That's the problem. Yeah, so the, the whole point is that that's kind of little to no work for the user, so you don't have to go in and hack everything together yourself. You create a uh, basic profile, you press enter, and then it's hopefully small enough. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just because in my life it always was motto to be as generic as possible, and uh, unfortunately for more than 25 years of my uh, miserable career, I found that apparently you cannot have it all, and it's usually 20 on 80. That's how it is. How is this different from using Alpine? Uh, that because I trust the content that I build myself. That's the only difference. I already said I, I am not allowed to put in airplane or the car something that I don't know what it is inside. I, I took Alpine from, uh, from the outside. I, do, I don't know who, who made it. What kind of back, uh, back doors are there? I don't know. I have to build it myself. And uh, Mezzotint apparently allows you to do that. You can use Alpine if you build your Alpine in your home and you know that this is your apparently fully trusted, you can use it. That's not a problem. So why do you Uh, I trust the bootstrap because I isolate from my repositories only. I build my operating system and distribution in-house and totally offline and say I am building exactly from that. No, no, uh, but I, but uh, yeah, sure, in, in, this, in, in this demonstration, sure. But um, what if I have my micro distribution, right? And I have it totally offline. And I use the script was the bootstrap, right? But it takes only from my packages. I can use something else. I can use zipper root provisioning. I can use DNF. Uh, it's, it's up to you what you use. You can use your bash script and just install all them by force. So that's the deepest step here, just only example how you pr produce. But it, it can be anything, right? It can be Docker, can be uh, Builder, can be whatever else tool. So it, it, it just because you're more familiar with the bootstrap than, than with my pr private bash, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you've chosen the, uh, still the we slice an image. Have you considered um, building an image, running it, sees what its axis is, uh, so you do a sort of test workload, and that uh, will show which files are touched, only those files files are included. So you're a bit, bit like how you do. Uh, Profile-based optimization by running the program, seeing these paths are taken. Uh, well, running the program, seeing which, which files are used, because that would be the most minimal set. So it's it, it does uh, because you uh, still do the uh, it does run and it uh, matches all the files. That's access. Okay. Okay. Any, any other question? Uh, Okay. <laughs> is it purely a s storage issue or also uh, the lesses in the image that also means you have to verify less? Because storage is relatively cheap. Storage is cheap if you're not in embedded. <laughs> Stor uh, some of our hardware are much uh, less powerful than Raspberry Pi 1. Uh, it's cheap, not not cheap. Some sometimes it's really. I I don't want to build um, operating system on that thing. Seriously, I don't. It's very, yeah. Uh, since you said you had to verify everything, uh, does this mean it compares to uh, the tooling that's? Existing around Wolfy, where you get a full um, software bill of materials and whatever not, to be able to verify that everything that's in the system is correctly built and is always the same reproducibly. 
Yes, apparently we are trying that hard. Uh, we are working on S bombs as well because uh, you have to prove that there is no GPL v3, for example, or other licenses. And we also uh, want to ensure that when you build your package, it's completely offline and completely build the environment from genuine packages that we already built. So we are dealing with a lot of cycles and a lot of uh, these kind of things that we have to rebuild many times. We are building G GCC maybe 10 times or something like that. That's not fun, but uh, this is how it is. And we are bootstrapping all of them until all of them built exactly uh, from our sources that we have in-house. So we are totally offline. Any other questions? I think we're in the back. And how I get more so questions? That's wonderful. <laughs> oh, All right. So if storage space is actually really well limited for you, um, that m means you usually only run one of those flakes per computer or per, per machine or do you run multiple ones because I assume you get some dependency duplication if you run multiple ones, right? And the flake inside is just a container, right? So container has all the dependencies inside. So you can create workflow and your container can be very complicated or it can be only one app. It's up to you. For my, we use both. We sometimes we need something complicated, starting like the small database and uh, RabbitMQ or some other mosquito MQ or something like that, and, and it starts right. So typically you would use Kubernetes or something like that. In our case, it's just in its system fires something up. That's it. You know, we don't need any Kubernetes in car. You're not sitting on a Dell server after all, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? No. Say no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you then.